there is nothing like worship. Amen. The end days that we're in, if you're not in a place of worship, whether it's here or somewhere else, another ministry, don't go. Yes. Amen. I'm telling you, in these last days, worship is what gets all of heaven's attention. That's why when I was in the back, almost falling on the floor again, <laughs> during worship, I saw the angels to sin here, right above us, and they were just worshiping with us. Worship. He inhabits our praises. That's what worship is. Amen? Amen. Because in these days, worship is where you'll see God's angels, and you'll commune with them, and they'll give you instructions where they are with you from the day you were born. For God so loved the world. 1 John 4, 8, God is what? Love. Everything God does, you may not think it, is done in love. His chastening is done in love. The testing of our faith is done in love. You know why? Because you get to a place where when you test it and you go through the test, like John said, and you go through the fire, sooner or later testings don't affect you. Because you know the outcome. He gave you the victory. He's overcome the world. That's one of the reasons He came. We talk about this first verse in John, the third chapter. A lot of people quote it, but they just quote a couple verses. They don't quote as many as I'm going to do right now. We're going to read 16 to 21. It's what He came for, and it wasn't just to save you. Jesus came to do so much more when He got here, and when we have a study on what He did for you, that you could never do. Jesus did what no man could do. Remember, He was never born of the seed of man. He was born of the Spirit. That's why He was so holy and so pure and His blood so powerful. He wasn't born because of the will of man. He was born for the will of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost that were writing out history before it ever started. So He came so pure and holy. And that is the only reason He could accomplish what He did. Because no man can accomplish what God did. He can't. No sacrifice can accomplish what Christ did because all, the blood of animals does nothing. They were sinning by Sunday afternoon when they sacrificed the animal in the morning. Amen. Somebody had to break that power of sin to keep you in bondage. In John 3, 16 and 21, it says, For God so loved the world that what He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds be exposed, but he who does come to the truth, he who does the truth, comes to the light that his deeds can be clearly seen. They have been done in God. Salvation is the gift, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. You're saved by grace, and that through faith it's not of yourself, it's the free gift of God. God gave you salvation. You did not earn it, but by believing you received it. See, he didn't come to condemn. Romans 8, 1 and 2. Therefore, there is no condemnation that those who are in Christ Jesus that don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. See, God came to do so much here. We work on our salvation, but we forget what He really accomplished, what He was sent forth for the Father to do. And it's so important today. We're going to talk this whole message. Pray for me, because it's going to be tough to get through this without breaking down, because I've been crying for two days over this message. When I started studying all that Christ did. He didn't just die and rise again, church. He did so much more. That only He alone can do. That's why He alone is worthy of our praise, of our honor. To adore Him, to worship Him, to be in love with Him as His bride. He stands alone. There is no one else to worship. Humanity started worshiping people many years ago. Let me tell you something. You worship and exalt people, you put them on a pedestal, and you know what? They're going to fall from there. There's only one at the right hand of the Father. His name is King Jesus. He was a sinless lamb. He is now the Lion of Judah, and He's coming soon. Oh, hallelujah. John 17, just <coughs> verses 4 and 5. Mm. John 
John 17, 1 to 5. We're just going to read 4 to 5. See, you got to know why He came. It wasn't just to save you. He brought heaven to earth. He brought the kingdom of God to put it inside of you. Boy, during that song, Deborah's blowing the shofars, and uh, Claudia at the back door waving flags, Carol up front waving flags, the angels were dancing, and we was having worship, amen? Amen. See, and I was just loving that. I mean, wait, you know what that is? You know what? David's army, they went out and played instruments, waved the flags of victory, Jehovah Nisi, the banner of victory above you. So we, we, we had, we're having church today. This is what it's all about, Amen. But John said, coming together, being a family of one with many parts. It's so important you see why the Father sent the Son. Look at Jesus in John 17 talking to the Father. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you. What? Before the world was. See, everybody just, they look at salvation, Jesus came to save us and wash away your sins. If that's your belief system, you don't really know God yet. You've never studied the work He was sent to do. He was in a holy habitation with the Father and the Holy Ghost. It was written what He was going to suffer. It was written before He left heaven and emptied Himself what he was going to accomplish, the signs, the wonders, the miracles, all that he was going to do was already written. What Jesus spoke was already written in heaven. The multiplying of the fish, the dead being raised, the blind eyes being opened, all that was written. Heaven came to earth and spoke all those things into existence. But only one could do it. There was only one holy enough, pure enough, righteous enough, and what is that word? Agape love, the unconditional love for his creation. There was only one person that had love so pure it could finish what it was sent to do. Amen. This is so important today that you get a hold of what Jesus came to do. When He said, I have finished the work which you sent me to do. Man, I hope someday when I'm standing before the throne, I can say, Father, I finished what you sent me to do. Yeah. And boy, if I question myself, when God starts to sift you, let Him sift you. I've gone through things lately with the Lord I didn't know I had to go through, but obviously I did because there was still too much of me left. God's not going to entrust Himself to live through me if it has anything to do with me. I have to be an empty vessel for God to fulfill the destiny for which He wrote about me. And actually, that's for all of us. You know what He takes out of you? What hinders the communion with the One who lives in you. All he does is take out the wounds, the hurts, the pains, the sorrows, so that's what's left is a pure love of Almighty God to touch this world with, because that's what's going to heal the world. Because when people see that you love them, they're going to want to get to know the one that taught you how to love. Yeah. Unconditionally. Unconditionally. Yeah. You can't have any bitterness, you can't have any unforgiveness, you can't have any judgmentalism in you. And nowadays it's hard not to judge some of these people what they're doing. But I don't see people anymore. I see they're walking in the light. Oh, they got company living inside of them and it's not the Holy Ghost. Because people wouldn't do what they're doing in and of their nature even if they weren't saved. They wouldn't do it. It's, demo it's demons in people. You can't hate the sanctity of life and innocent babies in their mother's womb and promote every kind of perversion which brought fire on Sodom and Gomorrah, brought the flood in the days of Noah. You wouldn't promote that stuff if you even had a conscience left. You would have read the book and know what's written is an infallible word and it's going to come to pass. Amen. 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 And it's coming. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The work that He sent Him to do. Mark 10, 44-45. We're going to go through some of the things today that Jesus was sent to do. So all you have to do is believe in what He finished. Amen. And when you start believing in what He did, it will set you free from yourself. You'll stop trying to earn from God. You'll drop, stop trying to receive and get something from God. Because He's already taken care of anything. Mark. Mark 10. It's 35 to 45. We're just going to read 44 to 45. And so, 
And in this and in this part of the chapter, they, one was wanting to sit on his right hand, one was wanting to sit on his left. No, that doesn't work that way. God is alone is exalted. He chooses where you're going to sit. Mm. Watch, what, watch what Jesus says. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be what? Slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life, what? A ransom for many. That's one of the things, that's one of the works that the Father sent Him to do. He was the price paid for your salvation. Because there's no dollar sign on it. You can't buy something that's unbuyable. See, God can't be bought. And it's so important today. That word ransom means to be purchased. To be bought out from. He paid. He was your purchase price. See, so stop going to God thinking you've got to do something to get something. He's already paid for everything. Your inheritance, your mansion in heaven, it's already paid for. My retirement home's paid for. And you know what? You know what's great? It's already built. Because I've seen it. I've seen your mansions, church. I've seen them. I've seen them. What John said today about being a family, the mansions in heaven are all connected. You know why? Because it's one family in heaven. There's no denominations. There's no color in heaven. It's a family of one the way He designed the church to be. Amen? Amen. It's such a shame there's such a division between races today when in the Bible you can't find that. Nobody can tell me there's color in this book. All who believe in the Lord Jesus are His family, are His bride, are His very body, are the church. There is no separation by color, nationality, or language. Language doesn't mean you, you don't believe. People get saved all over the world. Languages we don't even know exist yet. Amen? But they're going to hear about Jesus. Because when that happens, He's coming. Amen? 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 So that's the first thing He was sent to do was to ransom you, to purchase you, to buy you out because you was all slaves to sin. Yeah. Well, not you, Melissa, but... I had to throw that in. Galatians 3. These are the things that Jesus was sent to do. What He accomplished for you that you could never. You could never. Because only God can do these things. My job is to believe in everything He finished when He got here. That's why when I say I was healed, when we prayed for Valerie today, I said, don't even think that you, you're going to get healed. That is the worst thinking you can have. We were healed, it says, by His stripes. I'm not ever going to be healed. I already was here. I was healed at the cross. I'm not going to be healed. I am healed. Because it says, by His stripes, ye were healed. By the stripes of God, we are healed. And this next verse proves that you shouldn't tolerate sickness in your life. I'm not saying that it's not real. I'm just saying don't tolerate it. It has no right to you as the temple of God. Galatians 3, 11 to 14. But that no one is what? Justified by the law in the sight of God is evidence, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ hath past tense, redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Wow. See, the curse, when you go back to Deuteronomy 27 and 28, there's three pages of curses. They got put on Jesus. So when they come for you, remind them where they belong on the cross of Christ. Because he, he became sick, so you don't have to be. Do we get sick? Usually it's because we wear ourselves out. The only times I've been sick since I've been saved is I did it to myself. God was telling me to slow down a little bit, and I ran right into the wall. I don't know how many times I've done that. Hey, you're going too fast. Take a break. Rest. Sit down. Calm down. Relax. Take it easy. I got this. I'm just helping you. He said, well, if you're obedient to my voice, you would learn to rest in me and trust me. Now, none of you have ever had that problem. Oh, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Your pastor's a work in progress. That's why he needs prayer all the time. Amen? <laughs> but that works of the law. See, you've been redeemed. You've been ransomed out. You've been justified. Galatians 2.16 says, By no works of the flesh shall any man be justified. It's nothing you've done other than believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ. 
He has done, He finished so many things. The work that the Father sent Him to do, He accomplished every single one of the ones He was sent to do, or else He wouldn't have went to the cross that day. It would have taken longer. He had a lot of time to finish what the Father sent Him to do, and He did it. And He did it perfectly. See, He walked and lived under the law to fulfill it. To break its power that you never live under the law again. But you live under grace and truth in Jesus Christ. That's in John the first chapter, I think it's verse 17. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. See, we're free from works. We're free from efforts. It says, everybody goes, well, well that faith without works is dead. Let me tell you something. Don't let anybody ever tell you that. Because if you're a born again believer, you're going to do the works of the gospel. You're going to love people. You're going to care about people. You're going to help people. You're going to counsel them. You're going to edify them. You're going to build them. That's the works of the gospel. That's why we give out a lot of money here to other ministries and stuff like First Choice and other places. And that ministry in Israel will give it to you, by the way. They have students that just graduated from the college we give into over in Israel. They're Arabs and, and they're Jews that have come to Christ. And now they're graduating to go out and reach the Arabs and the Jews for Yeshua. Amen. Amen. And you wonder why you're blessed here, huh? <laughs> and Father, we lift up our government that's turning against Israel right now, and I thank you the fear of God fall upon them. This nation will always stand with Israel as long as we're here in Jesus' name. Give them no peace, O oh God. Those who bless Israel get blessed. Those who curse Israel will get cursed. That's a warning to you out there and the government watching on video. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I said it. Get over it. <coughs> Hallelujah. Hey, if we don't warn them, somebody has to. The church has stopped warning our government the penalty of what they're doing. The pulpit has stopped warning the government what's coming if they don't change. And that's our job. That's our job. I have such a confidence in God that whatever He puts in my mouth by speaking, I know He'll back up His word. I know He will. Because He has to. That's one of those scriptures He gave me. I remind Him of it. Amen. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Ephesians 1, just 13 to 14. I want to show you. See, this is what God came and finished for you. What He accomplished for you. The work that He was sent to do. Watch this. It's not... I just kind of cut it down a little bit. It says, You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is your guarantee of our inheritance, and you are His purchased possession. See, you've been bought. 1 Corinthians 6.20, you've been born of Christ, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. See, we are a purchased possession. Without Jesus coming, you're still doing the works of the flesh to try and get to heaven. We'd still be barbecuing animals in a pit in the back of the church building. Trying to get forgiveness. See, now, that was for the remission of sins it covered sins. The blood of Christ erases them. As far as the east is from the west. Psalm 103. 1 John 1 9. He is faithful and just. If we confess our sins to him, he'll cleanse us of how much? All unrighteousness. Psalm 103. I'll forgive all of your iniquities. Isaiah 43 25. For my name's sake, I remember your sins no more. There's no record of it. It was covered in the old covenant through the blood of Christ. Your sins are now erased and remembered no more. Don't ever remind God that you sinned because He can't remember that far back because He doesn't have a record of it. Amen? Amen? That's how powerful the blood of Jesus is. That's how holy it is. That's how purifying it is. Psalm, what, Isaiah 118, though your sins were as scarlet. Yes. Remember that word, were? But now there's white as snow because there's no record. See? You guys are talking to God about stuff that He has no record of. You're bringing up stuff that God never will. There's nothing written in heaven about you. Because of the blood of Jesus, only what God's going to do in you, through you, and for you. Like last, like last Wednesday night, I was in here got a vision of that scroll that's over this ministry, that powder blue scroll that everything God wants to bless you with, do for you, and how He wants to use you. It's written about you. It's right here. It's right here. Amen? Amen. God is so faithful. So remember something. These are the works that the Father sent the Son to do. He has done so much for us. If you've got your Bible, turn to Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 6 to 11. Oh, God is so good. God is so good. We need to be so grateful, church, for what Jesus has done for us. We need to have such thankful hearts. You know, if we start being grateful and thankful, God will do a lot more. If we stop grumbling about what's going on in the world. Amen. 
I got a couple amens. You know why? Because when, when people say, well, don't, don't you watch the news anymore? No. No, not a bit. Why? Why? It's in the book. If you want to listen to what's going on in the world, just read the book. Go to Matthew, the 24th chapter. My wife's been meditating on that chapter. She says, oh my God. I said, yeah, you're living it. You were seeing it. It's happening. But we belong to Jesus. Amen. 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 We're protected from this stuff. We got God. We got angels all around us. We got a whole entire angel army around us. Protecting us, worshiping with us. The more we worship, the more we praise Him. Like John said, meditate on the Word. We'll get to that in a bit. Romans 5, 6 to 11, the work that Jesus was sent to do. Watch this. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ did what? He died for the ungodly. For scarcely a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God, but God demonstrates His own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been what? Justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For when we will watch His enemies, we will reconcile to God through the death of His Son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only that, but we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom what? We've now received reconciliation. We could teach three sermons just on those two paragraphs. What Jesus did for us. Justifying. Reconciling. I mean, He has done so much for us. When you look up those words, what they really mean, what He has done for us, you'd be a lot more grateful for your salvation. Amen. Hello? 2 Corinthians 5.18, we've now received. See, when you got reconciled to God, that's part of your calling. Now you're a reconciler. See, you got reconciled to God through Jesus. Now you're to help others do the same. That's part of everybody's calling. It's amazing. People want to know what their calling is? Read the Gospel. Jesus tells you what it is. The Great Commission. And part of the Great Commission, and it's not just reconciling lost souls, but people that have walked away from God to reconcile them back to Jesus, telling them it's not too late to come back. Remember, the Bible talks about us that are walking with the Lord to help restore those that have walked away. For God rejoices as much over them, ones that have walked away from their calling and their purpose, when you help bring them back, heaven rejoices over that like somebody just got saved. Because God's, God's whole heart has come back to me. It's not too late yet. you got time. But there's not a lot of time left on this planet for us to affect lives out there. Amen? Yes. Amen. Everybody, a lot of people seeing the stuff I'm seeing in the Spirit. There's a move of the Spirit going on right now. Like John said, you know, Friday nights, if you just want a place to come hang out and lay on the floor and pray, come here. Because let me tell you something, we got plenty of, the, the angels move when we're worshiping, okay? Amen. Remember, they walk through the walls, they hover on the ceiling, they don't have to worry about getting in your way. Because they're in the house. We see them every Friday night in here. See, Sundays are so powerful in here, you know why? Because of this worship team on Friday night. Yes. They come in here and we worship. And we exalt Him. And we lift up, it just kept going Friday night. One of these Friday nights, we're just not going to leave, I don't think, because the anointing gets so strong. Like John said, your, your legs are weak. You're wobbly. You're drunk in the Holy Ghost. I don't drink anymore, but this is better wine. Amen? Amen. It's a much better wine. Thank you, yes. Jesus. Hallelujah. But it's so important that you see how much Jesus has done for you. Remember, you were an enemy of His. You were an enemy of His. See, all what you used to be is past tense. You are not that anymore. You are a brand new creation in Christ. Don't even bring up what you used to be. Unless it's a witness to somebody. Like I said, I can use what God delivered me from. My testimony is not that I got set free, but the one who set me free. Amen. See, He gets all the credit and glory because I didn't deliver myself. I didn't go on this quest one day, get up when I was hungover or wasted on drugs and say, man, I'm going to go find Jesus. No, He tracked me down. And He drew me in. And he convicted me so bad because of the prayers of the saints that were praying for me that I finally got up that Sunday morning and went over to a friend's house and he took me to Santa Monica. And let me tell you something. Where are we at? June something, right? June 16th, I'll be 30 years old. Oh. <laughs> no, but guess what? He came and got me. There's not a soul on this planet that goes and finds Jesus because you'll never find him with that mentality. It says, no one comes under me unless the Father draw him. Amen? 
So somebody was praying for you to have an epiphany with God the way you went, I'm in trouble. I need help. I need a Savior. I need someone that actually loves me and cares about me unconditionally. See, God didn't come to me, okay, I'll save you if. He didn't say that that Sunday morning. All he told me was, I love you. That's what he told me. The demons came out, the Holy Ghost went in, and my life had purpose and meaning for the first time in 37 years. I actually enjoyed getting up that Monday morning for the first time since I'd been born. I actually looked forward to getting up the next day and telling people I met Jesus. Why are we still not doing that? You lost your first love. And it happens to people, because like John said, we get so busy with the world, things are happening, jobs, family, stuff's going on all around you, circumstances, and we forget why we're here, to share Jesus. It is, it, it, he runs businesses, he knows this stuff, he gets so busy, phone going all the time, uh, I don't let him, he walks in, he wants to just shut the thing off, I can't, I'm surprised he brings it in some nights, but he has to. But you know what, though? He's right. If you're so busy that you don't have time for your love affair with Jesus, you need to either do something about it or give God permission to do something about your schedule. Amen. If you don't give Him permission to change His schedule, you do not trust Him to take care of you. Boy, look how quiet it got. Did you see that? Could have been drop. Let me tell you something. When God kind of took my... I'll take care of things, manhood thing away. I got this. I'll take care of it. I've always taken care of myself. I can do anything. Yada, yada, yada. I had all the scriptures to back it up. I can do all things through Christ. My job to take care of everything. My job to do this. He says, boy, you're really important, aren't you? He said, not one word you said means you trust me or believe my word. I've called you to something. Not to take care of yourself but to proclaim my son to the ends of the earth. To be my vessel. It is my responsibility, Dennis, if you're obedient, to take care of you. You can't take care of yourself because you never could before me, did you? I said, yeah, I kind of made a mess of stuff, didn't I? See what I'm saying, though? When God calls you to something, if you want to make conditions on what you're called to, you do not trust Him, nor do you believe in the calling. Nor in the one that called you for a divine purpose. You remember, you have a heavenly calling. And if you really trust God, if He tells you to come walk on the clouds, if He tells you to go out to Lake Mead and walk across it, and you're not going to sing, are you going to do it? Yes. Make sure you heard from Him, or you better have your swimming trunks on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sharing. A lot, of people, a lot of Christians have gotten in trouble. They said, I can do all things through Christ, and they, they go out and be all kinds of stupid. <laughs> Don't understand. That's not wisdom. God says, make sure you got confirmation in your heart. I don't listen to my head. That thing's, I don't even go there anymore. God speaks from my heart up, not my head down. And that protects me, amen? And it will protect all of you. So remember what he came to do for you. John 15, 13 to 14. See, this is the work that the Father sent the Son to do. And when you realize all that he accomplished for you, and all he wants is you to love him back. Because nothing I'm talking about could you have ever done on your own. There is no justifier, there is no savior, there is no healer, there is no provider, there is no sanctifier, there is no redeemer. There's none of that. Jesus is all that and more. Amen. It's so important, church, we have grateful hearts this morning. John 15, 1 to 17. We're just going to read 13 and 14. Greater love. Greater love has has no one than this than to lay one's life down for his friends. Look what Jesus says. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. See that last verse in Romans? You are enemies of God. You are enemies of the Holy One of Israel, the heavens and all the earth. You know what Jesus came to do? Make you his friend. Make you his friend. Not a slave, but a slave to righteousness. Okay, fine, Paul says that. And you should be a slave to righteousness. Anything that's unrighteous, you should want nothing to do with it. But it's so important today. He calls you friends. He calls you friends. He calls you friends. He calls you friends. Remember what Adam and Eve lost walking in the garden when they fell? He died so you can have that same walk back. A spiritual walk with God, walking on the clouds. 
What is it? I made a note here. Proverbs 18, 24. He's that friend that sticks closer than a brother. You not only have a friend that walks with you, he lives in you. Why do you go somewhere else for counsel and mentoring when you got the God of all creation and knows you better than you know you? So many Christians go to Christian councils and they come out more messed up than when they got there. You know why? Because they read psychology today. They don't read the Bible and counsel people. You want, he says, I'm the mighty counselor. Okay? So when I'm struggling with things, I go in my office, I get quiet, I put my head on the Bible and say, I need some counsel. He's never failed me yet to answer me. Why are you looking to people for wisdom and counsel on the one who lives inside of you and made you and formed you and knows you better than you know you? Why would you go so... It's good to have good godly counsel around you. But be careful who you get your counsel with. Just because they say they're a Christian and they know how to counsel someone, the devil comes in a ravenous horse in sheep's clothing. I had to help a lot of people that spent a lot of money at Christian councils and they messed them up. Man, I spent three or four hours with the Bible and praying with them a couple sessions and boy, they was good to go. They said, what did I just do for the last two years? I had many people like that. What a shame that somebody sits with somebody and gets out their psychology books instead of the, the book of life. If people need your help, give them the book of life. Because all their answers are written in there. There isn't an issue in your life that's not written in there and doesn't have an answer for it. Because that is the book of life. Remember, He is the Word. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. So it's so important today if you see what Jesus came, the work He came to finish for you. <clears throat> and when you really meditate on all that He accomplished, your whole concept of Him will change. Because you realize, wow, everything I get from God, everything He's done for me is a gift. In the New Covenant, your only job under the New Covenant is to believe in it. Do you realize that? It's not about fancy prayers and fancy words or anything else. It's about talking to your best friend. Everyone on this planet's an enemy of God unless they've been born again. Amen. Amen. Yes. It says in Ephesians, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. They say, that's my guarantee. I've had people tell me, well, people can lose their salvation. Well, those are for people that never really got saved, by the way. I got two pages of scriptures if you ever need that. Somebody can tell you lose your salvation. I'll print it out a bunch of copies. No, you can't. A person that's truly saved, can they struggle? Can they go walk back in the world? Sure. Or is God going to give them up? No. What belongs to God, He never gives up. He never casts you away. You may go struggle and get yourself in trouble, and that's okay. All you got to do is one minute in prayer on your knees, and God will restore you. He doesn't give away what will. Nothing can take you out of your Father's hand. Nothing where your name is written, by the way. Thank you, Jesus. You are His friend. Stay that way. If you have your Bibles, turn to John. No, don't even go there. I'm just going to read one verse. It's on, our, it's on our ministry cards. The three most powerful words in the Bible. There's not three more powerful words in the Bible than what I'm about to read. There isn't any. Because without Jesus finishing the work He was sent to do, this planet is long gone, burned up with fire. Amen. Amen. John 19.30 So when Jesus had received the sour wine, He said, It is finished. And bowing His head, He gave up His spirit. Oh, Jesus. It is finished. He finished the work that the Father sent him to do. I'm going to list some things right now that he finished. We don't have enough time to talk about it all. I'll keep talking till midnight. I'm good. <laughs> but I think some of you are probably going to want to go home and eat and stuff, so that'd be a good idea to stop somewhere along the line. Um, about one o'clock, two o'clock. I'm getting pretty hungry myself. So, but you know what? Listen to the, what Jesus finished. <coughs> Open your heart to the Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth that lives within you. And look what He finished for you. Because He so loved the world. He didn't have to come and do it. He said, I freely lay my life down because I have the power to take it up again. He did not have to go to the cross. The Father gave Him an out. He didn't have to, he was God. He didn't have to finish the work he was sent to do. But then no one would follow him. There would be no hope for humanity if it were not for Jesus Christ. Going, Father, I'm going to go to the earth now. I'm going to empty myself of the glory I have with you right here and right now. I'm going to pour myself out. I'm going to empty myself. 
and I'm going to be born into a woman, and I'm going to live as a man, although being God, I'm going to do that. I'll be back, Father. I'll be back with the glory I had with you before the world began. When I started meditating on that the last couple of days, I'll be honest with you, it wrecked me. He looked at the Father, he says, I'll be back. Now think about what Jesus did for us, amen? Let me show you something. When Jesus finished his work and he bowed his head, he accomplished all that he was sent to do. Watch this. He saved us. He bore us. He, we are a purchased possession. He ransomed us. He justified us. He redeemed us. He reconciled us. He saved us from the wrath to come. He washed away our sins in His own blood, which makes us worthy. He made us a new creation. He made us ambassadors of the kingdom of God. He made us as righteous as His Holy Son. He made us priests and kings to serve God. He made us the temple of God. He made us His bride. He now calls us His friends. He took away the fear and the sting of death. He conquered Satan, etc., 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 etc. He said, Father, I'll be back, but i got some work to do first. I literally saw it in the Spirit when He left heaven. When He wanted to marry His womb, because He's Spirit. Pure, holy seed of life wanted to marry His womb, because she was pure and holy. She was a virgin. The whole virgin birth is so intense and so powerful. If we haven't meditated on that, that would shake us to our core. It's amazing we don't take time to learn what Jesus finished when He came. And we really need to, church. i got a couple little verses I'm going to finish with because I couldn't go any longer. Um, we need to stop our lives for a moment. And look what Jesus has done for us. How can we not live for Him when He said, Father, I'll be back? I heard that in my spirit yesterday, and it just, it just, I just sat at my desk for about 30 minutes. I didn't move. When He said, I looked at my Father, and I said, I'll be back. i got work to do. And we complain when God requires something of us. We complain while I'm too busy. i got stuff to do. No, you don't. No, you do not. The church needs to realize something. Jesus is Lord of all. And if He's not Lord of all in your life, and would He require something of you? And you got the audacity to tell Him, I'm busy, i got stuff to do. No, you don't. You're not your own. I'm not my own. I thank God for the crushing He's done to me. My love affair with Jesus has gotten deeper through the trials like John talks about in the testing of our faith because I see God's faithfulness through every wave, every storm, every fire. All it's doing is purifying me. So what's left is Jesus. So what's left is Jesus. The church needs to go back to being in love with Jesus. You're not your own church. We don't belong to ourselves. We gave up that right when we got saved. We should never take our salvation for granted. Forgive me, Lord. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15. I had to do some repenting the last couple days. I don't know about the rest of you. Watch what Paul says. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and rose again. What compels you, church, to get up every morning? Is it the love of Jesus Christ that's in your heart? 
Yeah. I'd do some repenting the last couple of days. Because we all get selfish. We all get busy about our own little world when it has nothing to do with our little world. It has to do with His world, His universe. I mean, I did some crying this weekend. I said, forgive me, Lord. I felt sure. And all he did was hug me. Tell me how much he loves me. You can't do anything that will stop God's love for you, ever. You can't. It's impossible. God is love. God is love. He brought me to repentance this weekend, which is one of the greatest gifts He did for me. When God breaks your heart, it's a great thing. It makes you more like Him. It makes you just like Him. You love people differently. You love them the way He does. Because that's what's going to save this world when we start loving people the way Jesus does. Amen? Mm -hmm. Romans 14, 7, 7 through 8. For none of us lives to himself. No one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Amen. Amen? Amen. No matter what, you're the Lord's. Like John was saying, meditating on the Word, Romans 12, 1 and 2. It says, offer your life as a living sacrifice to God. And you know what it says? That's the least you can do. It says, that's just your, your service to God. And then it follows up, do not be conformed to this world, but by the renewing of your mind. What John said during worship today. See, the Spirit moves in here. He's preaching after sermon during worship. Yes. See, because we're connected in here in the Holy Ghost. Through the bond of love. I'm telling you, church, if God needs to break your heart, you need to let Him. Because if there's stuff that's left of you in there, you're only hurting yourself, and you're not going to fulfill your destiny. You're not going to have the fullness of God that's already in you coming out. Because He's not going to... And He's not going to pour His love out through you if there's any motive in your heart other than you loving people the way He does. Amen. If you have any ulterior motive that doesn't line up with being in love with Jesus and that takes preeminence in your life, His love can't flow through you. It really can. And it's so important today... Yesterday in my office when he ministered to me, that's why I tell you, find quiet time with God. It is so important when you're quiet with him. You know what he wants to do? Heal you, make you whole. He wants your soul so restored and so one with him, there's not even a seam left anymore, it's just one. There's not even a seam left. But you have to be willing. You have to give the one that does surgery, not by a knife, but by the Spirit. To come into you, to cut out what's hurt you, what's harmed you, what's discouraged you. All these things that happens in our lives. Because all of you have been through stuff. Don't tell me you haven't. You don't live in a bubble. We've all been wounded. We've all been hurt. People have disappointed you. But the one thing I can promise you is God is my witness. He will never disappoint. Because He doesn't know how. He's a Father like no other. He is so loving and so caring and so kind. When he dealt with me yesterday on some things in my heart, and I wept, and I, all he did was make me feel so good about life. He didn't judge me. He didn't hurt me. He just broke something open that had to be broken in my heart so that I could love the way he does. That's what people are going to know about you. They're going to know you have love for one another because your real family is sitting in this building. Those that are the blood boy, children of God. Those are the ones that you should be united with and fellowshipping with. I talked to somebody yesterday. If you're hurting and you're suffering, you do not sit in your house and try and figure it out yourself. You pick up the phone. You find somebody in here that's got a phone number and you pray together. Amen. When two or more agree on any one thing, never suffer, never sit there and suffer without calling me or somebody else. I don't care what time of day it is. I've been on call for 24 hours a day for almost 30 years now. Because I found out my life wasn't my own. He's been so good to me. How can I not be good to others? Amen? Amen? And He's been good to all of you. 
And we need to share the goodness of God with people, the love of God with people, because they need that more than... I mean, you go by somebody's house, but if they don't know what love is, what good's it going to do? A house without Jesus is just a building. It's not really a home. It's not really a home. You know how many people live in... When I, worked in, when I was out in the world and I worked in Beverly Hills in Hollywood, I went in these homes that were 15, 20, 25, 30, 35,000 square feet. Indoor pools, jacuzzis. They had furniture for furniture. You could have fit half the American in some of these houses. I think they were so big. And I was a heathen. But you know what I saw? The most unhappiest, miserable people this side of heaven. They had wealth upon wealth. They spent money on furniture. Just where I would deliver to, to the part of the house could buy us 15 houses here in this town. When you're spending $3,500 for an office desk chair, you got money. But you know what they didn't have? Jesus. They had nothing. They had stuff, accumulated wealth. They didn't know what no meant. But yet none of them had peace. And all those years in that town, they were, the, they were the most miserable. Everybody looks at them and goes, oh, look at the great life they had. No, they don't have a life because they don't have the Son. Amen. The Bible says if you don't have the Son of God in you, you do not have life. You are a walking dead person. You're on death row. I made it through without breaking down completely. Thank you, Jesus. Church, I want you to, I want you to meditate this week. I want you to pick up the Bible and you look up some of those words like ransom and justified and sanctified. You look up those words and see what it means to be ransomed out, to be a purchased possession. And you meditate on those things that God has done for you. It is finished. You received everything, the finished work that Christ did for you by believing in Him. Not by believing in yourself. I believe that God is my keeper. He's my Savior, but He's all the things I just said and so much more. So it's so important today that we really let go of our human thinking and come sit in the heavenlies with Jesus. Even Jeff saw that today. That curtain's ripped in two. You don't, you don't have to do anything to get into the holiest of holies anymore. The blood took care of it. The blood took care of it. Amen. He's so good. For God so loved the world, but not only did He give His Son, He sent Him here to do things that no man could do, no powers could do, only the Holy Son of God, the sinless Lamb. Amen? And fathers, we come before the throne of glory today, not because of us, not because of anything that's good about us, but because He sent Your Son with a list of things to do. And He looked at you before He departed heaven and said, Father, I'll be back when I'm finished. And that faithful day when Satan was rejoicing when Jesus was nailed to the cross, he rejoiced when he was put in the tomb. But on the third day, he conquered sin and death. He conquered and destroyed the grave. He destroyed the works of darkness. He crushed Satan under his feet. And then raised up a church that believes in him is now seated with your son in heavenly places, ruling as priests and kings through your holy son. Not because of us, but because of what he finished. He finished everything you sent him to do. Father, let us never take our salvation and the finished work of your son for granted ever again. Let us never spend another minute wasting our time being entangled with the affairs of this world, but to pray for the world, to pray for godly leaders, not in America, but around the world. That, Lord, you're going to tear down on godly people and you're going to raise up godly people to lead people as a people that believes in your Holy Son. Lord, there's got to be Holy Ghost people in our government. There's got to be Holy Ghost people in other governments. Because until the truth gets out, they're trying to suppress the truth. But your word, it says, can never be chained. So we thank you that the name of Jesus breaks every chain breaks every cloud of darkness over this earth, and let the light of truth in Jesus' name arise. And let people know that you are so alive, and that there's evidence of you in the church again, O oh God, in great signs, wonders, and miracles, as we proclaim that there's no salvation in other than our name. No other name can we be saved by but the name of Jesus. So Lord, I pray an anointing in here on everybody. Grace and peace to all these faithful saints. They show up every week, Lord. Encourage them, strengthen them. 
Show them the fullness of all that you've done for them. And that, Lord, we can never earn it. All we have to do is believe in what you finished, what you were sent to do, Jesus. We love you. We adore you. We exalt you. We magnify you. And we praise you, Jesus. You're coming soon. And we just thank you that we are yours. In Jesus' name. Let go of you today. God may have to break your heart to get what's in there out. I'll tell you it's not easy, but I'll tell you it's worth it. I got up this morning with more peace than I've had in 30 years of ministry. My heart felt so good because what was in it came out. It came out yesterday. And I thank God for it. So give Him permission today. It may hurt a little bit. I guarantee you, you're going to cry. And then you're going to see how much He really loves you. Because it's all about His love for us. There's nothing greater. There's nothing more you should desire. Paul said, the love of Christ compels me. That word compel is to take action, to do. You should be compelled to share the love of Jesus with everybody you meet. Some will listen, some will not. He says, some are going to stay in darkness. You can't do anything about that. But pray for them, amen? amen? We thank you for another awesome day, Father. We look forward to the rest of the day. Whatever you have planned for us, you unfold it because you wrote it out already. But we trust you to order our steps from this moment forward in Jesus' mighty and holy name. Amen, amen and amen. amen.